Think globally, act locally. It makes a lot of sense. Think about one of the great problems that our Earth is facing. Hunger, disease, poverty, pollution. And then do something about it in your local community. So today I want to tell you about a project that started right here in Princeton and is now spread over the entire planet. And when it's completed, it should change the planet as we know it. And as you heard, it's an energy project. It's a new way to make energy, a new way to make electricity. And so the first thing I want to do is ask the question of why. Why should we even consider a new way to make electricity? So, if you look since 1980 and look at the amount of electricity that is being consumed by our planet, by the countries on our planet, what you'll see is in the United States that for the most part, our energy consumption just goes up, 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 and up. But what's really striking is if you look at China in red, you can see that starting about 10 years ago, the amount of electricity that China is consuming is taking off as China industrializes and modernizes its society. And if you look at India, you can get a hint that the same thing's going to happen there. And China has more than one billion people, India has more than one billion people. And the amount of electricity that's going to be consumed by our planet is getting larger and larger and larger. And if we look at it, not by country, but by the type of energy that we are consuming, then what you see is that Going back from 1830 to about today, things were pretty much the status quo until about the middle of the 20th century, the 1950s into the 1960s, when the amount of fossil fuels that we started to consume took off, coal, oil, natural gas. And then in the last few decades, you can see that hydropower and nuclear power have started to have a larger and larger share. And the renewables, like solar or wind, currently are so small that they don't even fit on this chart. They're just a, a tiny, tiny little slip. And so we can start to ask questions about each of these sources of energy. So the fossil fuels, we know they're limited. We know that they're eventually going to run out. And the question we have to ask is, at what cost are we willing to extract them? And not just the financial cost, but the environmental cost. because. We know that when we burn fossil fuels, they produce the greenhouse gases that contribute to global warming and are changing our climate every single day. Nuclear energy doesn't make greenhouse gases, but we know that there's an issue around safety, the safety of our power plants and the safety of the fuel that we consume when we make what is a nuclear fission power plant because the wasted fuel from that, when we're done burning it, is highly, highly radioactive. And it's radioactive and dangerous to people and to animals and to the environment, not for tens of years, not for hundreds of years, but for thousands of years. And the renewables, and here I'm thinking mostly of solar and of wind, but anything that's renewable. The question we have to look at is, can we make them more and more efficient? And can we store them when needed because the sun doesn't always shine? and the wind doesn't always blow. And so, is there an alternative? Is there something else that we can do that can add to this mixture of energy as we need more and more electricity? If we're gonna make something new, we want that something to be clean, as little pollution as possible. We want it to be abundant. We don't wanna to have to worry about it ever running out. We want it to be available anywhere, not located in just a few geographical locations on our planet. We want it to be relatively small. We don't need large land masses so that we can just build a power plant about the same size as what we have right now in our existing power plants. We'd like it to be affordable. It can't be so expensive that no one can afford it. And perhaps most importantly, we need it to be safe. And so our clue for where we can find that is at our sun. And it's the core of our sun and the core of all of our stars, the power plant that's inside of our sun, which has been burning for billions of years and is going to burn for billions of years more. And what's happening inside there is a process that's called fusion energy. 
fusing small, small atoms together and making slightly larger ones. Now the sun does it by something called a proton-proton chain, one of many steps where protons are squeezed together by the enormous pressures that are inside the sun, and they make hydrogen. And we can't do that on Earth because we can't make that enormous pressure so easily. But we can get our clues from that. And instead of doing it with this proton-proton chain, we do it with hydrogen. We do it with other forms of hydrogen that are called the isotopes of curium and tritium. But we do that because we know that light charges, these pluses that represent protons, they repel. And so if we do it with an atom, with an element that only has one, like hydrogen, then it's going to be the easiest to fuse together. If we could fuse it together, we're going to make helium, which is just an inert gas, and lots and lots of energy. So this is our first clue. To do this, we need to make what's called a plasma. A plasma is a state of matter, solid, liquid, gas, plasma. Add energy to each of these, and you make a different state of matter. And the sun and the stars are plasma. And lightning is a plasma, and we use plasmas in our fluorescent light bulbs. We use plasmas to help us make computer chips that are in our cell phones and in our PCs. So the idea is to make this plasma, to make a star right here on Earth. So where are we going to get this fuel? Where do we get the hydrogen, the deuterium that we need? It's a form of hydrogen, H2O. The Earth is covered in it. And deuterium exists naturally in our seawater. We can extract it very easily. And tritium, the other one that we need to fuse together, we can make in our fusion reactors itself. And to give you an idea of just how powerful and how amazing this energy source is, if you take the top inch of Lake Erie, which is a big lake, but it's not as big as our oceans, if you took that top inch of Lake Erie, extracted the deuterium, put it into our fusion reactor, it's equivalent of energy to what we believe is all of our worldwide oil reserves left on the planet. So this is an incredibly, incredibly powerful way to try to make energy, to try to make electricity. So we need, of course, to figure out how do we hold on to this? I'm talking about making a small star, a small sun. And the clue is, again, we look to the sun and to the surface of the sun, where sometimes hot jets of plasma go streaming out into outer space. But sometimes they bend around in a circle. And what they're doing is they're following the magnetic field of the sun, on the surface of the sun, because the hot plasma can be confined and controlled by magnetic fields. And so that's our clue for how we can make a container here on Earth. And so what we do is we bend our container, our vacuum vessel, into a circle. We use what's called a vacuum pump to take the air out, put our little bit of hydrogen <coughs> gas back in. And we surround it with magnets, which is what's represented in brown here. So the silver is the vacuum vessel, the red represents the plasma, and the brown are the magnets that are going to cause the plasma to go around the inside of this donut while we heat it up and get our fusion to occur. Now we need to heat up this plasma to hotter than the core of the sun. The core of the sun is about 15 million degrees Celsius. And we need to make a machine that can heat up a gas into a plasma more like 100 million degrees Celsius. And so to do that, we do it in three different ways. And you can see here, I've drawn that donut shape, but I don't show the magnets in this particular cartoon. And the three ways we do it is radio frequency heating. It's sort of like a microwave oven. A microwave oven emits these microwaves, and there's a natural frequency, a natural resonance with water in our food. And so the water can absorb the microwaves and heat up our, our, our food. We do a similar thing in our machines, except instead of tuned to water, it's tuned to the plasma so that it can readily be absorbed. We do something called ohmic heating, which is like a toaster. And in a toaster, you run an electrical current through the wire that's inside the toaster. There's a resistance to that electrical current going through that heats the wire and makes our toast. And so we can run electrical currents through our plasma in the same way because the resistance of the plasma will heat up the plasma to the temperatures that we need 
And the last way we call neutral beam heating, and it's sort of like when you play pool, and you take the white cube ball and you add energy to it, it hits the other ones by colliding. And we'll send beams of particles in and they'll collide. And if we do all of this together, and if we have our magnet holding on to everything, we can reach temperatures of 100 million degrees, sufficient to cause our hydrogen to fuse together. So this is Professor Lyman Spitzer. Professor Spitzer was a professor here at Princeton University. And he's standing next to one of the first machines ever made. This is back in the 1950s. He called this machine a stellarator, a star generator. And you can see it inside of the wooden structure that he's standing next to. Four years later, also here in Princeton, we made a machine called the toroidal fusion test reactor. And now you can't even really see the donut shape. You can barely see the magnets. But to give you an idea of the size of this machine, over there in the corner is a person standing next to it. And here we are inside it. And so here's a person kneeling down inside the donut. And here's a picture of when this machine is on. And that's what 100 million degree plasma looks like from a camera that's outside looking through a window. Today, the largest machine isn't here in Princeton, it's in England. But you can see the same sort of shape, and now the person inside can easily stand up and can't even touch the ceiling. But these machines haven't just gotten bigger, they've gotten much more powerful. And to give you an idea of how much more powerful they've gotten, what I've done here is I've shown in green what is often called Moore's Law. And Moore's Law has to do with computers and how fast they're getting. And every 18 months since 1970, our computer speed, our computer chips, they've doubled in their speed every 18 months. And that's what I've shown in green. In red, what I'm showing is what these machines are doing and how much fusion energy they're producing. And what's happening, you can see from the slope of that curve, is that it's not every 18 months that it's doubling. It's every 12 months, and it's tripling. So we need to now go to the next step. And that next big jump, that next big machine, is way out over here. And it's actually even higher. But that machine is being built right now. The entire world is coming together and building a machine that's going to be this next big jump. It's being built in the south of France, and it's called ITER, which in Latin means the way. And when this machine is done, sometime after 2020, it's going to sit inside this building right here. And this will be the very first machine which makes more fusion energy than it consumes. And to give an idea of the size of this machine, there's also a person, and you can see right down in the bottom. That person is about my height. This is an enormous, enormous machine. But this machine, remember, is now finally going to be that next big step. It's not going to make electricity. It's going to prove that we can use our magnets and our heating systems to hold on to this star that we're making here on Earth. So how are we going to make electricity? Once we get that machine done, then what we need to do is we'll take our, our fusion reactor and we'll take the energy that comes out of it and we'll connect it to a heat exchanger. And that heat exchanger, and this is what happens right now, we'll go ahead and say boiled water to make steam to turn the blades of turbines that will be attached to a generator that will put that electricity right on our existing electrical grid. Now we're working on what those machines will look like right now. We're not 100% sure. So here are some slices through our donut of some ideas that we have. And you can see that the shapes are somewhat different. They're bigger and they're smaller this way. But we're eventually going to come to a, a consensus on what this machine will look like. And we'll be able to go ahead and make electricity and prove that we can do it reliably and robustly. Now, we still have some challenges. This is an incredibly, incredibly difficult thing, if you think about it, right? Make a 100 million degree plasma, hold on to it, pull the energy out of it. And the whole world is, again, coming together to solve these challenges. We have to figure out just what is the right way to make our container. How to take the plasma and how to twist it and shape it so that it is as efficient as possible. We have to make sure that it's as stable as possible, and so that if there are any turbulence or any instabilities that cause the plasma to come out, we can control for those. And we have to make sure that we use materials 
that are incredibly rugged. Because remember that inside of these machines, we are holding on to a star. So fusion is this incredible thing, because fusion is clean. It doesn't produce greenhouse gases. The pollution that it makes is incredible. It's available because we start with water. It's relatively compact. It's going to be right next to our existing power plants when we're ready to go. We're going to build a fusion power plant. And when it's finished, we're going to take the wires connected to the electrical grid, move them over, and we'll put our energy right onto our existing electrical grid. It's dependable in the sense that we don't have to care about whether the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. We can put them wherever we want. As best we can tell, they're going to be economically affordable. They're going to compare in price to what we have right now. And they're safe. It does not make long-term radiation. It cannot melt down. It cannot explode. If anything goes wrong, the reactions just stop. So we have this list of exactly what we want. And so, Starting in the 50s, here in Princeton, to today, to about 10 years from now, when the machine in the south of France will, for the first time, make energy, more energy than it consumes, to another 15 years or so when we make our first power plant, to roughly around 2040 to 2050 when we start to put fusion energy onto the electrical grid. When this is done, we will literally change the planet because we will have this source of energy that anyone can have that is clean and available. And so you can say that we will finally have the power of the sun in the palm of our hands. Thank you.